Good evening. As she said, my name is Sister Laura, and um, we've been in the diocese for about 30 years. We were invited by Bishop Untener, and our mission is to pray for the needs of the diocese as well as the world. So I'm gonna give you a kind of a story that tells you about my prayer life. This time of separation and isolation due to the threat of the viral pandemic, as well as the resulting economic and political upheaval in our country, has given me time to think. Time to look back on my life and the decisions I have made. In doing this, I am aware of having a deeper understanding of myself and others. For me, these gifts of understanding are part of the treasured gift of my spiritual journey. In college, I pondered questions like, who am I? Where am I going? Why am I here? Gradually, these philosophical questions turned into questions about the meaning of life. Did this or that choice help me understand the reason for my life or contribute to my life's well-being? After high school, I took a year of technical training to become a laboratory technician. I worked in a county hospital. I liked the work. However, soon boredom and routine got the better of me. I looked out the hospital windows and wondered, what are other people doing? I joined the Peace Corps and worked in Tunisia. That changed me. The strangeness of everything both challenged and delighted me. However, the hardest issue was the language. They speak several languages, Arabic, French, and their own version of Arabic, their own dialect. While I knew the very rudiments of Arabic from six weeks of language school, it was not enough. From this experience, I learned the value and comfort it is to communicate with others. Unable to say much more than my basic needs, I became very isolated and lonely. I have some of those, these same feelings of isolation and loneliness with our current stay-at-home orders. Later in my 30s, I became a member of the Contemplative Order of Poor Clares. This turned out to be a very formative decision. Living with a variety of women who were often very different from any I had previously known, reshaped me in ways I could have never foreseen. I discovered that living with others who are intentionally dedicated to the spiritual journey is both supportive and challenging. I learned as, a poor I, learned as I lived with poor Claire's that being part of the community living was a way of slowing down quick judgments and opinions. Time and willingness helped me to unlearn some rash behavior that I had de developed while growing up and defending myself against three brothers. I slowly learned that I had to understand others point of view. I learned that I had to tame my ego. I had to learn no, new ways of responding to others. Once that happened, I remembered life's interactions changed for the better. Let me give you one example. I am amused as I remember an adventure when we decided to replace the carpeting in our chapel. We agreed on the color, 
put down our money, and decided to do the project in stages. The carpet installer took out the old rug, and to our surprise, underneath, we found red oak wood flooring. It was in very bad condition, but it could be refinished. This situation presented all the ingredients for a community challenge. There were four of us making the decision. There were two sisters who didn't want a wood floor because of the loud and hollow sound made by people's shoes. My choice was to keep the beauty of the redwood floor and refinish it. The fourth sister didn't care which way the decision went. I presented my case with very convincing facts and figures. The other two sisters were unmoved. They simply did not want the wood floor. I listened to them carefully in order to understand their point of view. When I learned their reasons for wanting the carpet, I finally could let go of my need for the redwood floor. I could accept having carpeting. Realistically, it's not all that altruistic on my part. I realized that I did not want to live with two sisters who were jarred by the sound of wood floor, the sound the wood floor created as we prepared for prayer. I agreed that the carpeted floor would be quieter and softer, which I must reluctantly admit turned out to be true. This decision didn't, did take a while to resolve. We had to give each other time to see another point of view. The waiting time was not to allow the opportunity, not to allow the opportunity for us all to create better arguments for or against the chapel. The waiting time was to allow me to let my desire for the aesthetic value of the wood floor and to be open to the sincere feelings of others of others that had about the carpeting. By this time you realize this is not about the carpeting or the wood floor. It's about something I learned as I lived in community. I learned to harness my will and allow room for the will of others. I now work to honestly see another's point of view. In doing so, I gain something better than getting my own way. I'm learning more about myself, and now that I am more, and know that I am more than my personal preferences. As a result of these and many experiences of my spiritual journey, I have received new gifts of insight that I treasure every day. I am reminded of the often repeated statement of the late Bishop Untener was fond of saying, come the kingdom, all that matters is how we have treated each other. Come the kingdom, all that matters is how we have treated each other. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I'm Jim Girding. Uh, my wife Kathy and I have been uh, parishioners here since 2001. I can't believe it's been 20 years when we moved back to Michigan. So we're happy to be here. It's a great uh, family of parishioners that we. Uh, have come to know. First, I wanted to give you a little background on alms. The word comes from the Greek, meaning compassion and mercy. So in its original sense, when you give alms, you are dispensing mercy. We know alms as money or food given to people in need and also as well as performing other acts of charity. In short, giving of alms is an effort to share this world, not only through the distribution of money, 
but through the sharing of our time and talents. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2462, for your, those attorneys in the crowd, um, teaches that as one of the three pillars of Lenten practice, almsgiving is a witness to fraternal charity and a work of justice pleasing to God. We're all familiar with uh, our own personal almsgiving, such as our financial support to the parish, whether it's through the Sunday collection or modern day electronic means, or responding to the diocese Christ mission appeal and various other organizations like the Catholic Relief Services and especially during Lent with the Rice Bowl. Uh, but Holy Spirit, as a parish, is also involved in almsgiving. My goal here tonight is to briefly summarize some of the ways that our parish works to positively impact the lives of those in need in our community. Holy Spirit is a tithing parish, meaning that as a parish we're committed to providing support to those in need. Our Parish Christian Service Tithing Committee was established in 2006 when Father Dave Parsh was pastor. And Sister Marie was instrumental in organizing the committee and coordinated its operations for many years. She also drafted me as a member. She was uh, difficult to say no to, I must say. Um, Tithing. The word tithing, you know, comes from the Old Testament. It's, it's uh, a practice established by God of returning 10% of your blessings that you receive back to God. Um, my understanding is that the church teaches that offering some form of material support to the church is obligatory for all Catholic adults who are able to do so. The church doesn't specify a percentage or anything like that. Uh, when the committee was established, it was determined that the parish back in 2006, or 2000, yeah, 2006, would set aside 4.5%, uh, 4.5% 4 4 .5 of the Sunday collections for distribution to those in need. So over the past 15 years, the parish has distributed almost $700,000 to organizations and people in need. Besides uh, myself, there are, there are five other members on the committee, Rick Boone, Rich Brown, Amy Knapp, Sandy Marsden, and Kathy Miles. We meet periodically. Uh, there's an application process. We do some interviewing and asking a lot of questions. and. We uh, meet to decide and assess the needs and to allocate a recommendation for the parish to distribute whatever funds have been set aside. Last December, uh, the committee met and, and we recommended funds be paid over to 10 uh, organizations. So this kind of gives you an example of what we've been doing. The 10 organizations were Community Village, which is an assisted living program, Eastside Soup Kitchen, which is a food assistance program. The Emmaus House, which provides transitional uh, housing for women. HIS Restoration Ministries, which is, provides housing for homeless pregnant women. Hospitality House, which provides housing for out-of-town patients and families receiving medical care in Saginaw. Life Clinic Community Resources, which uh, removes the barriers that cause women to choose abortion. Old Town Soup Kitchen, which is another food assistance program. Mustard Seed, which is a shelter for homeless women and their children. Saginaw Recovery House, which is a fairly new organization, which is a drop-in center for people suffering from substance abuse. And the Cathedral Neighborhood Breakfast uh, program, which is another food assistance program. I just want to spend a couple seconds uh, highlighting two of those organizations. The Mustard Seed for, is one, and their mission is, quote, we water the seed of inner strength in homeless women so they can make a better life for themselves and their children. 
unquote. The women and families come mainly from off the street. You know, they're, they're homeless. So they don't have a place to, to live or they've been living in cars and whatnot. They're hurt and broken. They find it impossible to make any progress in the right direction. What mustard seed does is they first tend to their basic needs of food, shelter, clothing. And then once they settle in, the staff and the volunteers listen to their stories and begin to connect them to resources that will help them both, um, to help, that will help them physically, mentally, and spiritually. They assist in, you know, obtaining their uh, birth certificates, social security cards. They apply for assistance with Medicaid, food stamps. They help them com complete uh, their GED and, and technical training. They, they provide transportation to their jobs, appointments, meetings, provide some financial training and literacy and then ultimately transition them to long-term housing. Uh, the second entity or organization I wanted to highlight was Life Clinic. As I mentioned before, their mission is to, or their mission is to restore hope by offering physical, emotional, and spiritual support uh, to the community. Their primary objective, as I mentioned before, is to remove barriers that cause women to choose abortion by providing them with free early prenatal care and referrals, ultrasounds, pregnancy and parenting classes, and various supplies. Their second objective is to improve maternal health and infant safety, so babies not only survive but thrive, by providing them long-term, one-on-one support from staff and volunteers, and offering the opportunity to experience Jesus' love. There's an education program that, in, that includes topics on pregnancy, fetal development, childbirth, sudden infant sin, death syndrome, infant safety, car seat safety. And then the parents can choose uh, various supplies, including diapers, sleep sacks, cribs, car seats, formula supplements, baby food, bathing accessories, clothing, and et cetera. Most of the uh, clients of theirs are between the ages of 18 to 29. They're unmarried and are living uh, below the national poverty level. So those are just an example of two of the organizations that we provide financial support to. The other, uh, as a parish, the other area, uh, it's more than just writing checks uh, to almsgiving. So, some of the non-financial ways that Holy Spirit provides services is through the blood drive that we have, uh, various things like flood recovery assistance. Recently, we you know, offered the, our facilities to the township to uh, collect uh, trash caused by the flood. We also are involved with the Thomas Township Habitat for Humanity Builds. And our Knights of Columbus does a lot of other various charitable works. Um, in that regard. To wrap this up, I wanted to go back to Matthew chapter 6, this time verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and decay destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor decay destroys, nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. So the bottom line, sorry, that's how us accountants speak. Uh, the bottom line is giving to those in need is an important expression of our faith. And we do our giving out of love for God, without drawing attention to ourselves. When we invest what God has given us to impact the lives of others, we can trust that the results will make a difference, both now and for eternity. Thank you, Jim. That was very good. We appreciate it. I get the uh, gift of talking about fasting. 
Um, I'm first going to tell you that I'm not going to bore you with the fasting and abstaining rules and regulations. I'm pretty sure most of you know them. If you have a question, see me afterwards and I can kind of clarify things if you need me to. Sometimes it's best to look back in order to see how far we have come and how far and changed we have become as time moves forward. How many of you remember Ash Wednesday and dreaded it? Not only were you gonna get that black spot on your forehead, which already had you pegged as a Catholic, but you had to decide what you were going to give up for 40 days, which seemed, when you were younger anyway, an eternity. Well, let's start with the dictionary definition of what fasting is. To abstain from food or to eat sparingly or abstain from some foods. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, however, has a different definition, as you can well imagine. They say fasting refers to limitations on food and drink. And abstaining in this context means refraining from certain kinds of food or drink, typically meat, poultry, those kinds of things. Fasting is not something new. You can read about it in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, fasting does not appear as a strict practice, but as a token of sorrow, also as a sign of repentance, and also accompanies prayer in crisis or great need. In the New Testament, fasting is hardly spoken about at all, although Jesus did presume that his followers would fast at times since that was the Jewish custom. But if they were to fast, he wanted them to conceal it and make no public display of their devotion. Jesus himself went to the desert for 40 days and prayed and fasted before he began his ministry. By the time of Christ, Fasting and abstaining were venerable traditions in the Jewish areas and the piety that the Jews practiced. In the early church, it was not unusual for them to have a two or three day Lenten fast. But it wasn't until the Council of Nicaea that 40 days was even mentioned. Among early generations of the newly baptized, prayer and fasting were also <clears throat> linked together for the purposes of doing penance and for growth in Christian spirituality. Eventually, the idea of a Lenten fast among Christians was broadened by Catholic custom in Europe to incorporate all of the season of Lent from Ash Wednesday to Holy Thursday, except Sundays. Sunday was your get out of jail free card. And what it was meant to do, it was meant to be a spiritual discipline that many older Catholics can certainly recall in great detail even today. Current reflection on the meaning of Christian fasting seems to underscore the spiritual value of the practice and the practical help it can lend to persons who truly wish to grow in their relationship with God through penitential actions and self-discipline. Fasting is best done, however, within the context of a prayer life that includes doing acts of charity, works of mercy, daily prayer, almsgiving, and social action endeavors. Catholic leaders still encourage all Catholic individuals, families, and parishes to elect to fast regularly on their own, even though many of the fasting laws and <clears throat> from the past have been relaxed. Since the 1960s, which was the time that Vatican II came along, 
Official church rules regarding fasting and abstinence were relaxed for a special spiritual reason, namely to encourage members of the community of baptized to become more personally responsible for meeting the general Christian mandate to do penance for one's wrongdoings. Thus, the Christian community expects all its members to do penitential works, and it is, in some way, up to every church member and family, household, to decide if regular penances will include fasting, abstinence, almsgiving, works of charity, prayer, devotions, or some other form of spiritual development. Part of this change has been more emphasis on something a little different, which would require people to become more aware of those things in their lives that can be distractions, things that can cause them to lose human contact or things that make them frown. Some of these things could be bad habits we have fallen into that we fast from and could be changed into a good habit over the 40 days of Lent. What if I fasted from A in order to feast on B? Some friends and I came up with a list of a few things that may be a way of your fasting this year that could change not only your life, but the lives of others with whom you come in contact. So right now, what I'd like you to do is just to get comfortable and close your eyes and listen to some of the pairs of fasting from and feasting to that we have come up with. What if we fast from junk food and feast on healthy food? Fast from dining out. Feast on donating the cost of the meal to a charity that feeds others. Fast from unkind words to feasting on kind words. Fasting from being a couch potato and feasting on exercise. Fasting on overeating and feasting on portion control. Fasting from disobedience and feasting on obedience. Fasting from lying, even the little white ones, to feasting on truthfulness. Fasting from negativity and feasting on positivity. Fasting from computer gaming and feasting on family table games. Fasting from impatience and feasting on patience. Fasting from meanness and feasting on gentleness. Fasting on indifference and feasting on compassion. Fasting from fear and feasting on courage. Fasting from ungratefulness to feasting on gratefulness. Fasting from gossiping and feasting on complimenting. Fasting from unnecessary use of cell phones. Feasting on reading a good book. Fasting on tuning people out. 
and feasting on listening. Fasting from being grumpy and feasting on being good natured. Fasting from unbelief and feasting on faith. Fasting from despair and feasting on hope. Fasting from selfishness, feasting on charity. Fasting from the cup half empty to feasting on the cup half full. Fasting from isolation in your room to feasting on conversation around the table. Passing from impulsive to feasting on being thought out. What can you add? And I'd like to close this with a prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for these three different experiences of praying, of almsgiving, and fasting. We ask you to continue to be with us this Lent as we walk and journey together to the Easter feast. We are grateful for all that you have given us, and we ask you to open our eyes to what needs to be opened and to help us to continue to walk in your ways and change a frown into a smile. And we ask all of these in your holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>